that who never stood up for or were a bit shy or afraid to stand up way back then, never imagining that what we've been through over the last three to four years would actually be a bigger uh, push for us to stand and continue to speak and wanting you to have the, the freedom to stand to speak and be present at a protest because they, they were taking your pictures, pictures of your, your number plates. They probably still got them. Are you policemen out there? They're probably still there. But you know what? Shady and slimy is really what happened to a whole lot of people during that time. And I'm proud of those people that have continued to stand. And right across the nation, we could have, we could have said, let everybody come to Auckland and then let's meet in Wellington. But we thought, no, let's Wellington let them have the lower the North Island, they can gather together, and then those in the South Island will meet a million in Christchurch. But then we're all going to come together on Tuesday the 5th in Wellington. Because you, your voice matters. You know, it's not just about Brian and Hannah Tamaki. We're very thankful that we're very bold and we have faith and we'll be prepared to stand. And purely we've done that because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us the strength to stand. Even for people that aren't of faith, we stood for you too, because you still have a right for a voice and you still have a right to be able to stand and make decisions for yourself, your family and your body. For those people that were mandated or those people that were forced to take the vaccine, you know, I'll come right to you, because we know so many do not want to go. Hi everybody who's tuned in on the live stream. Um, so we've got Hannah Tamaki addressing the crowd. I'm just going to go up the hill a little bit to sort of give you a bit of a view of the size of the crowd. It's quite sizable. Uh, Hannah's over there um, by the tent. And as you can see, a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of bikes parked up, which is pretty cool. Uh, got a few police, a few people sitting on the hill listening to the speeches. It's all good. I'm not going to have too much to say here. Uh, I think it's really good that people are out here expressing their point of view. Uh, and of course, that there's, there's no trouble at least in the right, So this is probably just going to be pretty much footage of, uh, film from here. I'm going to um, I'm going to film through the six. I'm going to jump in the crowd in a minute and, uh, and get a shot of the whole crowd around me, sort of thing. All right. So uh, talk to you later, everyone. on the way, they deserve to have the life that we all had before all this nonsense started. So thank you all. Thank you everyone who's travelled. Appreciate you all and God bless you. Thank you Hannah. It's a good girl. In the last elections we've just finished, New Zealanders spoke with their vote <clears throat> convincingly by a long margin and wanted to see the back end of Labour gone forever along with the Greens and the Te Pati Māori and mostly we wanted to see the back end and never again see her name even, Jacinda Ardern, probably the worst Prime Minister that we've had in history, it's definitely the most indebted Prime Minister we've had in history and a Prime Minister that never ever cared about her own people in this country. So how the hell will we vote Christopher Luxon and National with Seymour and Winston, I was looking forward to having some peace, maybe just just get us through whatever you're, you're overturning as far as bad legislations go, but I was hoping there was no smell of Labour on any of them. But I'm, I was wrong. And Luxon, the worst thing he did was to have a cup of coffee with the monster herself, Jacinda Ardern, in a meeting that was clearly open because it was in the news and they were laughing away together like nothing had happened. For the fact that Christopher Luxon 
whether it's naivety or just a matter of, you know, I just don't, I just want to get on with it and don't want any, anybody to be called out specifically. <clears throat> Let's get on with the new future, as he said, get back on track. I don't think so. I'd have to think that Mr. Luxon has some involvement with the World Economic Forum, that he's a globalist. He certainly is a soft leader, and I'm willing to still give 12 months of, he has to qualify himself, that he can prove to us that he can start to be a real leader. He has to be a leader for the coalition. He has to be a leader for this country. Right now, Nationals had a bad start. And the worst start he had was after he had a cup of coffee discussing the Christchurch call, which Jacinda Ardern started with her mate, the wokey president of France, Emmanuel Macron. They put together the Christchurch call after the Christchurch massacre and its purpose was basically to keep a watch online mainly for any terrorist uh, uh, activity, terrorism. Well, I can tell you they've done a bad job of watching and calling out terrorism because one of the worst terrorist acts in recent history happened on the October the 7th in Israel when Hamas brutally attacked Israel unannounced, burned, raped, and killed, and pillaged, and paraded dead people, young women, civilians, as most of them, up the streets of Gaza while Palestinians clapped and cheered. That's the time that I think that Jacinda Ardern and her so-called Christchurch call <clears throat> looking out for terrorist acts should have been the biggest voice on the world stage to say something about that but she didn't she said nothing and what we do know about Jacinda Ardern that she's now coming up to the fifth anniversary of the existence of the so-called Christchurch call and in the last four years or five years coming up she's been paid by the and funded by the taxpayers of New Zealand and I can tell you, she is definitely getting 500000 half a million dollars to her. Supposedly, she said, I'm not taking a wage, but the 500000 does go to the Christchurch call anyway, and other little wee hidden associated costs that we're paying the monster who brutalized our country, damaged our lives, ruined our economy, divided our country, and cause such mayhem that now is not measured just by jobs lost and businesses crushed, by the mental, emotional and physical anguish that people are still going through. The aftermath of what she did in Labour will go on for many, many years. Many Kiwis having to be immigrants themselves and bail out of this country because of the hurt and the harm that was done to their lives. This is despicable and it's shameful. And you know what? We should never forget this because it's only still fresh. It's not that long ago. We cannot just get on with our lives. That's the problem with Kiwis. Their biggest problem is money. And unless you touch their money, they won't do anything. Most of them know about this, but they're not interested as long as they can get on their car, back to their work and to their beach patch. I'll tell you honestly. And then they think they get on with it and forget it. These were huge crimes, criminal acts against the citizens of this country and against humanity. They cannot get away with it. Now, here's our first step in beginning to do something. And there are other things that are happening that I haven't got time to talk about. But they're lawsuits that are coming from the citizens. We're working together behind the scenes and I'm a part of that and bringing these people to justice. They're not going to get away with it. Don't you worry, a class act citizen suit's coming against them. We'll be calling them out. We're taking the government to court. We're taking these people to the, to the cleaners. They're not getting away with it. I'll make sure of that and plenty of you will make sure of that. And New Zealand, all of those who know that these people committed heinous crimes. 
We're dealing with our children's children now and their effects on their mental condition. Crime rates and housing, housing problems, inflation and debt and, and the inability to be able to get workers in our country. Our country's been shattered, now immigration's out of control. And the central banking uh, situation is that they're going to bring digital currency and now Jacinda, under the front shop window of the Christchurch call, is actually promoting artificial intelligence. The big thing that she's been involved in behind the Christchurch call, it's just really a laundering shop for her, her possessed evil uh, desire to control us and to censor us and to make our lives miserable that she would come back through the back door and just because she's not been seen, I want to warn you, public, because Jacinda Ardern is quiet. You think that she's not up to nothing? She's plotting, she's been planning, and she's ready now to spring the trap. She's still working on how she can censor us to bits so that we can be silenced, your voice is silenced, to take away our freedom of speech, to take away our freedom of expression, that's what she's doing. She cannot get away with it. She will not get away with it. And so my suggestion here today to you is this, that we can make a difference. We can make one step toward getting some justice till we eventually have them all on court standing trial and going to prison. Because that's where they sent me. I'll say a bit more after that in a moment. Now, Jacinda Ardern, primarily behind the shop window of the Christchurch call, is she is censoring free speech. And she is working away, and who could ever forget her speech at the United Nations, where she basically said that free speech is a weapon. Our free speech, that you and I cannot talk as we feel and as we think, online particularly, but they would censor us and muzzle us in real life as well. And as it was said before by the guys, how many have known Facebook jail? Who had ever thought Facebook jail? Who would have thought that we've been shadow banned? I know all of these, I get it all the time, shadow banned. And then content that you put up is, is deemed as, as misinformation or misleading information. Can you believe this? And so they are spying on the public. They are in control of the information and the conversations you have. They are watching. I have proof from an OIA from, and thank the Lord they didn't redact it like you get all this. Isn't it a blimmin', a, 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 you know, a, a hand, but you get an OIA and so it's all redacted. I was like, what the heck is that? Official Information Act, for somebody who doesn't know what that means, it means that it's supposed to get the information about what these creeps are doing behind the doors where they're supposed to be serving us and listening to the voice of the people, not getting on with agendas and ideologies about killing and crushing and damaging our lives. And so when you get the information about the horrendous corruption and the plotting behind the scenes, it's all redacted. Now that in itself they should be taken to court for. For, for interference in, in illegal or, or lawful and stuff that really should be open and revealed to the public. When we want to and we want to obtain that stuff to be able to see what they're doing. There's no accountability. That's what that means. Once you vote them in, they change. So Jacinda is now wanting to censor free speech. And she's working at that with Christopher Luxon. He made a statement, and on quotes, and you can go and check these quotes, the media can, Mr. Luxon not only is going to hire her and, and again, give her the job behind the scenes quietly, still influencing different people, and if Luxon's that friendly, what is, where does that leave us if the Prime Minister is in cahoots with the monster? What's that? Chris Luxon, you should not be associating, talking, having coffees with your ex-boss. And they discuss stuff, he said, and this is what he said. I will be taking the Christchurch call to the next level. That's what he said. This is the new Prime Minister we trusted and you voted in. 
He's saying he's going to take the Christchurch call to the next level. What does that mean when him and, and Jacinda are, are chummy pals? That means they're going to screw us down again. It's going to come through. So I'm going to let you know that when we go on the 5th, that's next week to Parliament, we're going to put this to Mr Luxon that he has got to uh, terminate her employment immediately. And that's... And I'm talking on behalf of most of the population of New Zealand. They do not want the monster Jacinda Ardern back in our lives. And the, the irony and the slap in our face is that we have to pay for her. We're paying her. I can't, I can't believe that we had to have this again because it's not, not long after the election and this damn stuff's going on behind the scenes. That, gee, oh, that parliament down there is still corrupt. It still needs cleaning. And he has gone in there and he's hiding, so he's got to terminate her employment. I believe the Christchurch call on his fifth anniversary is not fit for purpose. It has been proven now that it is not fit fulfilling its purpose. It's there for other insidious reasons. So therefore, Mr Luxon, we'll be coming on the fifth. We want you to terminate that thing. And most of New Zealand public do not want to pay Jacinda Ardern a single cent of their hard-earned taxpayer money. If you don't, there's going to be big trouble. If the fifth you're not, you've, you get this message now. We want her sat, fired. One of the things that Elon Musk did when he acquired Twitter, and I really salute Elon because he saw the problem with free speech, how censored the world was, and of course humans follow and they'll just settle into it, so they're absolutely censored and controlled to bits. But he stood up, took a hold of Twitter, and the first thing he did, do you know what he did? He fired all the employees on Twitter who are a part of the Christchurch call. Now, that must say something. If Elon Musk, the first thing he does is fires employees of the, of the Christchurch call. And here's us Kiwis allowing this thing under our nose and we are financing it. She's got to go. Say after me, Ardern's got to go. Say it again. One more. Ardern's got to go. And one more for Parliament and all and, and Luxon. Ardern's got to go. Okay. Now, the Christchurch call has to be terminated. We want to get rid of it. It's not functioning according to its purpose. And saying that, it's important that I say this as well. I want to talk about the, the great collapse. And I'm happy to say about a collapse and great together describes the feeling that I'm having right now about New Zealand mainstream media. Come on. You can cheer and clap. This is the beginning of the end of the legacy media. And I am one of the most thrilled in this country. I'm, after 25 to 30 years, the, this media has lied. They've slanted. They've poisoned the public's mind. They have misrepresented. You talk about misinformation and disinformation. They have been the worst culprits. And I, way back in 2021, called them the domestic terrorists of this country. <clears throat> if there is a terrorist cell that's been allowed to survive in this country, and shame on you, Kiwis, allowing this terrorist cell to survive and actually let it continue on as long as it did. And that's the New Zealand media. I'm one of the happiest today. Whoopee! Do a little dance. <laughs> Not a good dance, but... I am so happy to hear about News Hub's uh, pending collapse. Good job and good riddance. No sympathy for me, you dirty rats. You've done nothing but been uh, prostitutes for the politicians. 
Yes, you have. You've been prostitutes for politicians. You were given a fund, uh, the, the, the generous fund of over $55 million and more dollars. Who knows how much they passed under the table to fund you guys, to, to buy you off, you sellouts, to, your, to the people that you're supposed to be uh, responsible to, and you got millions of dollars of taxpayers' money, and not once did you critique these guys, put the hard questions to the politicians, which you're supposed to do, and neither did you ever take the voice of the people when they wanted to keep the politicians accountable and critique and question them. You never did. In fact, you promoted the tyranny and the dictatorship and you bewitched the public of New Zealand. You misled us and you led us into destruction. Now News Hub, you're going. I see TV One, which is also publicly funded by us. Jeepers creepers. What the heck is this that we are funding all of these, these foul monsters and these tyrants and these dictators, ideological fools? TV, t television New Zealand belongs to the people, but they've never been for the people. They've never worked for the people. They've worked for Jacinda Ardern and the Labour government. And they've been their lackeys and they've brought them off with our money, selling us lies, giving us information that was false, misleading us into decisions, forcing us and carrying the evil narrative from Jacinda Ardern, Labour, Willie Jackson and the Māori caucus and Greens and Te Pati Māori and by gosh it looks like National are going to be hopping on the list too if they don't be careful and see more you better watch your step and please Winston don't let them run you over you stand up Winston and you keep shouting your voice out for the people stand for us and so now we see that TVNZ has registered a a massive half yearly loss Yay! that's good news and I was clapping and Woo! fell on my couch and said good job TVNZ these guys have to face the punishment and the penalty of misleading the public of New Zealand we and I want to congratulate you viewers online and here today that we all started to wake up to the legacy media and how they could be sellouts and how they carried a narrative of the far left wokey and also everything that ruins our lives and having a prosperous life and keeping our families together you were the culprits that carried that message and drummed it into people so that they would in the end be destroyed dvnz you deserve to go this is the end of the media industry as we know it now they're collapsing like dominoes i want you to put your hands together and clap for that and say yo let's cheer for that we're gonna watch and smile with smugness i'm not usually like this i have a lot of grace i've known to have a lot of grace and a lot of mercy i do i'll help you even if you hate me but for you guys there is no mercy you must go and we must start again with a whole new a way of communication that's going to be corrupt free it's going to bring good news it's going to work for the people it's going to bring truth not lies it's not going to poison our minds but it's going to give us exactly the information that is honest true and what is the truth of the matter at the at the time of what the news is that's what we want we don't want your slant we don't want your poison. We don't want your lies any longer. So TVNZ is going, now I just heard that stuff is stuffed. Yeah. Stuff is putting stuff stuffed off. So stuff off stuff. You're over too. Good job. You deserve to join the rest of your corrupt buddies. Isn't that good news? That's three I've named. <laughs> yes, sir. And New Zealand Herald, you're in our crosshairs as well. 
And if you think you're going to get away with it because you're as corrupt as them, you are not. The damage you've done to people's lives, I don't even know if you can even get forgiveness from God. And I'm in that business. You probably could if you repent. You're big enough to come out and say sorry to the country, which you won't. Neither would Jacinda, neither would Labour, neither would any of these politicians. They know in their hearts and minds what they've done to the people of New Zealand. They will never come. When's the last time you've seen a politician cry tears and say, I'm sorry, New Zealand, I made a mistake. Yes, I, I did some things that were not right for a politician to do. Well, we'll call it corrupt if you just do that. Wouldn't that be great if a politician actually apologises? Can you please apologise somebody from government for the way that you treated us for six years? That people lost their jobs, they were mandated, they were out of their jobs, they were, we were forced, many of them, were forced to take the jab to save their job. That's cruel. That's cruel. Is somebody going to apologise to the people of New Zealand? I bet you the undertakers of New Zealand have got a story to tell. I understand that the rate of deaths has gone through the roof since the vaccines were forced upon our population. Wouldn't it be great if all of the undertakers, trouble is, I, I might say this in a tongue-in-cheek way, but they must be making a mint. If only they would talk together and come up and say, the deaths that we're seeing now from vax injuries is real. And it's too many to say that it was COVID or some other sickness or just unexplained death. So there's that as well. We've got so much here and so much we can say. But look, I, I've given you those things there. And I believe that the thing that we must do today is stand up strong and remember to fight for free speech, freedom of expression. And I would also say that Christopher Luxon in one little wee Livey one evening stood up a livey and told New Zealand that there will be no referendum for the people. Can you believe that this guy actually stood up yeah. and he destroyed democracy in one livey? He destroyed democracy. Whether you it's not about the treaty principles, whether you're for or against, I'm not talking about that at the moment. I'm talking about the principle of democracy is that the voice of the people matters. And the matter was the treaty principles and between two people who founded this nation and for dear God that we're able to solve our difficulties and our problems and become one people. But how can you do that, Mr. Luxon, when you take out the voice of the people? You made a fatal error and cancelling the referendum. So we're going to say to you, as a part of the fifth in our visit there to Wellington, that we're calling on you to reverse that, and you're going to have to backtrack and call a referendum and now start to get democracy back in our country working again by saying the people must have a voice and a say in the issues of this country. And there's no more important issue than the one between Māori and non-Māori and how we forge a way forward to prosper and give our children's children a better future. Okay, what else can I say? I can say this and I'm, I'm done and I want to hear what you've got to say, freedom of speech. Here's the last thing I want you to do. I'm, I'm asking you, Mr Luxon, Mr Seymour, Mr Peters, that we the people want the New Zealand Bill of Rights enshrined in supreme law status. I have never seen such determined and spiteful and I think the way that these people did this was in the face of the public destroy the most precious thing to any human any citizen in any nation of the world for that matter. And we must, at all costs, protect our freedoms and our rights. This was the damage that was done to the public of New Zealand because the judicial system and the politicians did not recognise that the New Zealand Bill of Rights could work for the people when it was desperately needed. So I'm saying that we never never 
never. I never want to see this ever happen again. Where I was put into prison for 10 days. Not for going to a protest because you all went to a protest. But because I spoke up. What I'm doing now about the government's forced mandates. So I found by one OIA that wasn't redacted. Oh God, how, that was a miracle. And it came and it said Jacinda Ardern's office, she was getting daily briefings on what Brian Tamaki was saying online. Daily briefings. What I was saying online. So they were spying on me. They were, they were getting intelligence, just like this, about what a little humble, you know, church pastor, little humble, quiet, praying church pastor, was doing. Well, you know what I was doing? I was standing up for the rights and the freedoms of not just for my family, but for every New Zealander, whether you are a believer or not. It didn't matter what faith you were, it, this was a human condition. And so we never, ever, ever want to be in that position again. I was on 69 days after they let me out of prison for speaking at the protest movements and inciting people in the right direction. <laughs> and then when it went to the High Court, thankfully, otherwise I'd still be in there if my lawyer didn't have the nous to see that there is a backlog of so many months of hearings and you know most guys were in custody there because of their court appearances uh, were so so much so much delay so I was in there there's no promise he booked it before I even went to, <laughs> he booked it before I went to the next protest because he kept begging me He's the top criminal lawyer in the country and he was on his knees almost saying, please Brian, please Brian, do not go to a protest and speak. And I said, I've got to. I cannot sit back and watch our rights and our freedoms destroyed before us. <laughs> so on that basis he knew after four judges later and my fifth judge is when I got the hammer, four judges virtually pointed down the, the screen of me in, in the little dock and said to me, said to me, most said, Brian Tamaki, you're in contempt of my court. In contempt of your court? What the hell? Our nation's going down the gurgler and he was worried about the fact is that I wasn't obeying him. Now I'm a law abiding citizen. I'm not a lawbreaker. I'm not a criminal. Actually I'm a fantastic guy. If I may say so, I've got to say that because so many people say you're not. I've got to say sometimes to myself, you're okay, you know. But, you know, I mean, here's these guys who felt that my rights did not matter in an emergency. Do your rights matter in an emergency? Can they just take away all your rights and freedoms of choice just because there's some emergency? No, they can't. And so the last one said, right, Brian Tamaki, had enough of you, you appeared again, you spoke, you're inciting people in the right direction. They never said the last part, that's me, right? They always said I was inciting the public to false information. So I went to prison because my, my lawyer knew that I would do it again, so he booked the only slot for the High Court because he knew I'd go to prison and he knew I wouldn't stop. And he booked it, and I thank him for that, that he had the foresight to see that I would not stay down after four judges and the fifth judge, he put me in prison and said, that's it, you're going away. So I've been the country's first political prisoner. I was, I don't think it's, well, I don't want you to clap for that, it's not a nice record. But I was the first political prisoner for what? For speaking. Just for speaking. For speaking. Would you have ever thought that a New Zealander, a pastor at that, quiet little pastor, would go to jail standing up for the rights of all New Zealanders to have their freedom of expression and their speech. Thank you, Brian. So he went to prison. Now, thankfully, 
And I thank Ron for this. Public, I say his name, Ron Mansfield. And he said to me, um, when he saw the High Court judge, the High Court judge judged and said, this man should not be in, in, in jail. And, and then I, you know, I was in isolation. What do they call it? Solitary. Solitary. Eh? Solitary. Solitary confinement. That's where I was put, solitary confinement, just a square room, no natural light, and just that's it. They put me in there. I think they wanted to break me. But when I got out, the judge said he should not be in here and said he must be released. Then he got red flagged on the, on the computer system. So here comes political interference again. I had to wait five hours in prison for that day to hear the eventual verdict, which was at about 12 o'clock lunchtime. And what happens is the Labour government somehow, the, the um, Minister of Police or the Justice Minister said, if Brian Tumbuck is let out of prison, he's too dangerous. So we want to put him on house arrest uh, until such time as this was all over. He's not to be let free. That's what they said to the judge, the High Court judge. The High Court judge was perplexed. And now he's probably thinking this whole thing's corrupt. So he came back and the verdict is, you can go out of prison, Brian, but you're just going to prison in your house. I was on a 24-hour curfew for 69 days. And the police came unannounced at my door knocking. You should have seen the day that the big um, protest started in Wellington. I had four cops jump my fence like I was a bank robber. I was inside, you know, relaxing, having a whatever in the couch and I could see these guys suited up with guns and all that, four of them jumping over the fence and that, surrounding my door and just about knocking it down. And I said, Hannah, I said to go to the door and say that I'm down in Wellington. <laughs> and she said, no way, no way. I said, and uh, anyway, I, she, she opened the door and they were there, four of them. And they said, where's Brian? And I turned and came out there. <laughs> I said, here I am. What's up? You know? And they said, you stay here. So I hopped in the car the next day with four of my boys. And guess where I was heading? Down to Wellington. This is on the first day before it started. This, I believe, was my destiny. So I got as far as the VIN. I don't know what happened, but my lawyer got on the phone and I had it on the loudspeaker. And he said, Brian, where are you? And I said, why? Are you going to Wellington? One of them said, yes. <laughs> he said, stop right there. The cops are all waiting for you in Wellington. They're going to put you straight into prison for a long time. I said, oh, thank you. And he hung up and I said, boys, Wellington. The guy in the front did a U-turn and the rest of them said, you are not going nowhere near there. And they look at I'm telling you, they said, you're too precious to us. So they took me all the way back home handcuffed. Okay, I want to give this uh, back to the um, people who are doing the MC. I, I thank you so very much. I love you all and I appreciate the way that you stand, you come out. And um, together, we're going to win. We're going to see something happen next Tuesday. It will happen. Thank you so very much. God bless you. And um, please, if you want to say something, come up and say it. Thank you very much. Hey, well, just put your hands together. Come on. You know, with everything, eh, there's got to be a cause. And is this not the greatest cause that you and I have right now? to stand for this beautiful nation that we call Aotearoa New Zealand and the next generation. Okay, that's uh, me done, everyone. I've caught Ryan's speech. I thought it was really good. Like uh, certainly very, very interesting. I hope everyone's enjoyed my coverage. I'll publish it through 60 And I take this challenge that comes from this stage here. We call